how does starvation uh, change brain energy metabolism? So we've known for years, uh, for many years, that fasting is a way to cure epilepsy. There's been reports dating back, this, is, this dates back to 1922. And I mean, it's going back to the time of Hippocrates in 400 BC. So fasting was a cure for seizures. It's been known for a long time. So much of what we know about fuel metabolism or brain metabolism during starvation actually comes from the work of George Cahill at Harvard Medical School. His group performed uh, really groundbreaking work to demonstrate that the brain can use ketone bodies as a source of energy. Prior to the study at Harvard that was done in 1967, it was thought that the brain could only use glucose exclusively as an energy source. So he did uh, a very interesting study where he had medical students that were overweight. They fasted for 40 days, and it was observed that their blood ketone levels after about a week skyrocketed and actually exceeded the levels of glucose. And essentially what he showed is that ketones become the predominant fuel for the brain and peripheral tissues during starvation. Starvation, not eating food, and have no body fat reserves for fuel. Fasting, not eating food while having body fat reserves for fuel. Today we would call the Harvard study a fasting study. In our fed state, if we're eating carbohydrates or a normal diet, about 100, nearly 100% 100 of our energy, our brain energy, comes from glucose. But in a state of starvation, it's been shown that about two-thirds of our energy or even more, are, are derived from ketone bodies. So ketones function as an alternative fuel for the brain when glucose is not available. When given a choice of fuels, the brain prefers ketones over glucose. Dr. Ben Bickman. Ketogenic diet can mimic fasting in that uh, physiologically it can elevate blood ketones and lower blood glucose and you get a, a, a profile that's similar to a person who has fasted. So you really have to restrict carbohydrates and you have to eat a significant amount of fat to elevate blood ketone levels. Free fatty acids or fat from our diet and the mobilization of free fatty acids from our, from our adipose tissue, from our body fat, are processed in the liver through beta oxidation and form these ketone bodies. But we need to stay, we need to deplete the liver stores of glycogen to a certain degree and we need to suppress insulin uh, for the liver to be able to make these ketone bodies which are a very efficient high energy alternative fuel especially for the brain and the heart and also for peripheral tissues like uh, the skeletal muscle and the skin. When kids are uh, resistant to, to uh, anti-epileptic drugs or they become refractory to them, the ketogenic diet works when drugs fail. So it's actually become like the standard of care when drugs fail to treat uh, difficult seizures. And it's really grossly underutilized approach because it's so effective but it's still uh, just because doctors are not educated in the diet and, and also with compliance it's hard to follow. It's not prescribed too often. Study in rats. Use of ketone esters to raise ketosis against seizures. Ketone esters are formed by binding an alcohol molecule to a ketone body, thus contain more BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, for fuel. So more importantly, we found that these ketogenic agents or therapeutic ketosis with a ketone ester delays central nervous system oxygen toxicity in rats. So elevating ketones within this range uh, our experiment was set up to, to give a single administration of a ketogenic agent and then dive the rat in to 132 feet of seawater, which is five atmospheres absolute. This typically causes a seizure within about 10 minutes and, uh, in our rat models. But with the, uh, with the ketone ester administration, we can go over an hour in almost every scenario uh, the, the rodents were able to withstand, it gave resilience uh, against this environmental extreme to well over an hour. And we, we've demonstrated that we have a 575% increase in seizure resistance, which is above and beyond any kind of anti-seizure medication that has been tried in this model. So how can we exploit the therapeutic effect of ketones? We think that ketones, being in ketosis, will 
create resilience not only uh, against uh, hyperoxia or hyperbaric oxygen, but also during uh, potentially uh, hypoxia, which could occur you know, at, uh, during a stroke or during ischemic event, or even under hypobaric hypoxia or altitude. As we climb in altitude spaceflight, the, the pressure goes down and uh, this creates hypoxia in the brain. And we think there'll be ketones enhance energy production under low levels of oxygen, so you derive more energy per oxygen molecule. We think it'll be helpful there. Traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, these are all areas where I think ketones can be therapeutic. So our lab is studying right now, and I won't have time to go, to go into these, but we're looking at the application of therapeutic ketosis for Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as ALS, Alzheimer's disease. There's been a clinical trial that started at, at my university to look at this. They're using a uh, naturally derived ketogenic agents. Angelman syndrome, which causes seizures and motor dysfunction uh, in kids and different epilepsy models we're looking at right now. And we find that with ALS, Alzheimer's, Angelman syndrome, in our, in our animal models of disease, the motor function is off the charts. So the, the animals run faster on uh, a treadmill-like apparatus, and we see a, a lot of encouraging results, uh, preliminary results in our studies. Glucose transporter deficiency syndrome is a syndrome where uh, a, a genetic defect causes a, a downregulation of the glucose transporter in the brain. And the kids who have uh, glucose transporter deficiency, their brains are literally starved of glucose. So they need to stay on a ketogenic diet to actually prevent seizures and to prevent them from being totally uh, immobile. So the ketogenic diet needs to be very strict for them to be able to function. So a, delivering a ketogenic agent like a ketone ester could nourish the brain without the dietary restrictions. So we, we see a, a really big potential application there. With wound healing, in many cases, impaired wound healing occurs in older patients or smokers uh, where you have uh, high blood glucose and an impairment of blood flow to the wound area. Ketones have been shown to increase perfusion of blood into the area. So we have some, some really uh, encouraging data in our wound healing model uh, using uh, oral forms of ketones. We looked at a variety of cells to just curiously, we wanted to know what do cells do under hyperbaric oxygen, like what happens to cells. So we looked at muscle cells, we looked at fibroblasts, skin cells, and we also looked at various cancer cell lines. And we observed that uh, high oxygen is toxic to cancer cells. So it causes an overproduction of oxygen-free radicals, which, which overwhelms the antioxidant capacity of the cells, and it causes them to die. And, and oxygen toxicity happens in healthy cells, but cancer cells were selectively vulnerable to the level of oxygen that was relatively non-toxic to healthy cells. So they were just more vulnerable to the oxygen toxicity. We also demonstrated that ketones were toxic to cancer cells. So your normal cells, even in a, in a culture dish, they use ketones fine. If you give brain cells, for example, uh, if you're growing brain cells in a Petri dish, and you give them ketones, they grow perfectly. And if you take glucose away, they continue to grow and thrive. But if you're growing cancer cells, and you <coughs> take away the glucose and give them ketones, the cancer cells die. So our healthy cells have a very high degree of metabolic flexibility. So our brain, for example, and peripheral tissues, think of them as like a hybrid engine, right? So they can use glucose, and under periods of glucose deprivation, they can use fatty acids and ketone <coughs> molecules. So they use both fuels very efficiently. So cancer cells, they lack this metabolic flexibility due to defects in their metabolism or damage to their mitochondria. So glucose uh, becomes the predominant fuel for cancer cells, and they lack this ability to switch over to alternative fuels. Now, this can be seen that uh, it's been shown that tumor growth is tightly correlated with the level of glucose in the blood. So as glucose levels increase, there's a proportional increase in tumor growth, and several labs have reported this observation. At low levels of, of glucose, at hypoglycemia, very little tumor growth occurs. An example of this uh, in humans, a, a great example, is a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. 
which uh, shows glucose consumption in, in tissue. And in this case, this person has metastatic cancer. And you can see areas lighting up in the lung and in the liver and, and even in the bone with bone metastatic cancer. So what we observe here is that the cancer cells are essentially outcompeting the, the healthy tissue for glucose availability. And PET scan is really like the gold standard uh, to diagnose cancer and also to, uh, to look at the location of cancer and also to track the aggressiveness of, of cancer. So the more aggressive and the more deadly the cancer, the, the greater it's going to show up on a PET scan. And it was characterized uh, by Otto Warburg, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1931. He was the first to observe that these cancer cells have a, a defect in their metabolism that causes them to ferment <laughs> glucose for energy. And he was really the first to describe cancer as a metabolic disease. So what he proposed is that cancer cells have dysfunctional mitochondria. And this was a characteristic of all cancer cells. We know that cancer is, if you take a, a, a sample of a tumor from an individual or multiple types of cancers, you see a lot of genetic heterogeneity. So there's genetic defects that are very variable between people and also the same tumor itself. If you take samples from the same tumor, it's very genetically heterogeneous. But pretty much all cancer cells have the same metabolic phenotype, which is this glucose overconsumption. And it's due primarily, Warburg thought, to mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you scan the literature, all these things show up. These are all evidence, this is all evidence that there's dysfunctional mitochondria in cancer cells. So I think the greatest evidence comes from electron microscopy studies when we compare normal mitochondria, which have these cristae, which is the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. This is actually where energy is made. So you create, uh, the mitochondria generates ATP, adenosine triphosphate, within the cristae of the mitochondria. So here's an example of a brain tumor, a glioblastoma, which is a a very aggressive kind of brain tumor, and we see a crystallysis, a complete breakdown of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if this membrane doesn't exist, the, the mitochondria cannot generate ATP, it can't generate energy. Ketones are metabolized and fatty acids are metabolized exclusively in the mitochondria. So these organelles need to be functional. You need an inner mitochondrial membrane to be able to develop uh, or generate ATP. Just recently, we published an article in Carcinogenesis, which describes uh, that chemical and environmental triggers are, uh, can damage the mitochondria. So the idea here is that uh, as we age, we get progressive mitochondrial dysfunction, right? So normal mitochondria have very dense cristae, and as we age, that uh, the inner mitochondrial membrane starts to break down over time. It's a fact of life that your metabolism declines with age and there's a progressive decrease in mitochondrial function with time. And the mitochondria generate about 90% of the energy in the cell. So with progressive mitochondrial dysfunction from these uh, chemical environmental triggers, there's a decrease in mitochondrial energy production and a compensatory increase in a glucose metabolism to make energy. So as there's progressive mitochondrial dysfunction from these uh, chemical and environmental triggers, less energy is produced from what's called oxidative phosphorylation. And the nucleus of the cell requires a lot of energy to maintain the fidelity of the nuclear genome, right? So there's, there's very robust DNA repair mechanisms that's constantly repairing damage to your DNA. And these DNA repair mechanisms are intimately linked to energy production. So with mitochondrial dysfunction, you have an impairment of energy production that destabilizes the nuclear genome. This triggers the activation of oncogenes, genes that cause cancer, and can also inhibit tumor suppressor genes, genes that prevent cancer. So oncogenes, the activation of oncogenes increases
the, uh, the enzymatic activity of glycolysis. So it allows cells to generate energy from sugar. So we have mitochondrial dysfunction that causes genomic instability that activates the cancer genes. I like to say this is kind of a controversial theory, but this is what Warburg predicted. And the uh, emerging evidence from, from various groups are, are validating this model. So this was the rationale for metabolic therapy, is to exploit the mitochondrial defects that result from the Warburg effect. So the idea here is to establish therapeutic ketosis, elevate blood ketone levels, use a uh, nutrition strategy to decrease blood glucose, glycolysis, and gluconeogenesis. These are all things that the ketogenic diet accomplishes. It also suppresses insulin levels, which drive cancer cell growth and increase the, the tissue level of oxygen. So we find that hyperoxygenating tumor tissue increases free radical production, which can help kill the cancer. And it also turns on, uh, it turns off rather, oncogenes that drive cancer growth. So we asked the question, can therapeutic ketosis and hyperbaric oxygen be used to treat cancer? Now my colleagues at uh, Boston College and also at Barrow Neurological Institute, uh, Thomas Seifert and Adrian Scheck, has, have done some elegant work showing that the ketogenic diet can suppress tumor growth in various models. So we wanted to combine the ketogenic diet and hyperbaric oxygen together. And what we demonstrated is that the combination of the ketogenic diet and hyperbaric oxygen can prolong survival in mice with metastatic cancer. So we, use, we carefully chose a model of, uh, of cancer to study that's very aggressive and that relates to the human disease that causes cancer. Most cancer studies are done with an implanted tumor that doesn't metastasize to all the organs of the body. This particular model is very aggressive. When the tumor cells are implanted, there's rapid systemic metastasis to all areas and even the brain. And within about three to four weeks, the animal succumbs to the tumor burden. Now we show that with a standard diet and hyperbaric oxygen, there's a delay in the metastatic spread. With the ketogenic diet, there's also a decrease in, in metastatic spread and tumor growth, but the combination of the ketogenic diet and the hyperbaric oxygen is an extremely effective approach for managing, metabolic, uh, managing metastatic cancer in this model. We've also demonstrated recently, we, we published that ketones themselves inhibit cancer uh, viability in vitro. So even under high glucose, if we grow cancer cells, we can stain the dead ones and stain the live ones. And uh, in parallel to that, we grew cancer cells with high glucose and high ketones. And we saw a greater percentage of dead cells in our cell cultures. And we saw a suppression of uh, cancer cell proliferation. So this was even in the presence of high glucose. And we know that ketones can turn off or turn down glycolysis. They also activate various genes that may suppress uh, cancer growth. And we're looking into that now, mechanistically what's going on here. So to take it one step further, we did a combination of metabolic therapy uh, that was the ketogenic diet plus ketone supplementation plus hyperbaric oxygen. And essentially we showed that the combination of these together had the greatest effect overall. And we were able to, so with the control diet, which is high carbohydrate diet, this is a, uh, a survival curve with that diet. And here's a survival curve with a combination of these things together.